Changing Lanes, the official podcast of BMW. Welcome to this episode of Changing Lanes, the official podcast of BMW. I'm Jonathan Tilley. And I am Nikki Shields. And, uh, well, we're excited about today's podcast, not yes. only because I've got my winter jumper on, the seasons have changed, <laughs> <laughs> um, but also because, well, we are taking the phrase history repeating itself to a whole new level. Yes, sit back and enjoy a bit of a history lesson because um, well, we do like to talk a lot about the history of BMW yeah. on this particular podcast, don't we? Um but there is a direct link, I suppose, to a specific change that's happened in the past um, that is actually sort of seen as a blueprint to something that is going to change into the future. Mm. Cryptic, I know. <laughs> but do stay <laughs> listening. It will be worth it, I promise. <laughs> exactly. So you're probably wondering what's the past and what's the future and what's this blueprint that we're talking about. So here is the past part. The Neue Klasse. Oh, man, it can be seen as a symbol of change, which truly blasted business through the roof for BMW when there was this massive need for something new. And the future part, well, if you haven't been, you know, tapped into reality, it's called sustainability, right? So BMW <laughs> has set itself the goal of achieving full carbon neutrality across its entire supply chain by no later than 2050. So when we talk about history repeating itself, what we really mean is the major risk that BMW took in the 1960s with the Neue Klasse that resulted in huge change, massive success. I mean, think about it the Neue Klasse, and you just go, yes, you have an image right in the top of your brain. Now, that can be considered the blueprint to how BMW will change and achieve full carbon neutrality by no later than 2050. Ah. Yeah, and it is really an amazing target to have, um, I think, yeah. you know, particularly, as you say, that the big hot topic at the moment is sustainability. And by coming out and saying, you know, as one of the first car manufacturers to say, right, actually, our target, we are going to hit full carbon neutrality by 2050, which really isn't that far away if you think about, mm. you know, the full scale of the manufacturing process is really quite amazing. Um, now, you might be listening thinking, well, hang on a minute, that sounds like a bit of a stretch. <laughs> uh, and also, how does that um, analogy make any sense? Um, how on earth does the history of the Neue Klasse trailblaze our way to a more sustainable future. Perhaps you're thinking, are we going to talk about the kidney grill? The Hofmeister mm. kink. Love that Ooh. word, Hofmeister. <laughs> Gets me every turn. <laughs> um, <laughs> and then, uh, you know, yeah, there's obviously other iconic features of the Neue Klasse for all the petrol heads out there. Well, the good news is we are covering all of that and plenty more. So do listen in to find out. And uh, Jonathan, I do have to ask you my pronunciation of Neue Klasse. How is it? F fantastic. Uh, Five out of ten? Six out of ten? <laughs> ten out of ten. Oh, you're too kind. <laughs> I'll pay you later. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So speaking about the Neue Klasse, everybody loves a success story, right? You look at the awards, people winning awards. You see people, you know, living their best lives, you know, and you just go, oh, what a great success story. And the BMW Neue Klasse of the 60s is top of our list. Like, it is amazing. So few cars have defined BMW like the Neue Klasse did in the 60s. Now, the whole thing was BMW created this completely new technical concept, this no frills design, and an absolutely clear market positioning. Like I said before, when we say Neue Klasse, you have that image right at the front of your brain. I mean, this was a game changer, right? Both the company and the entire mid-sized sports sedan segment. I mean, it was huge. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, let's not forget that this success came out because there was this dire need for change. Yeah. Um, again, which comes back to we need change now when it comes to sustainability. Um, but, you know, back then BMW was actually in the midst of quite a lot of financial pressure. And it was actually after Herbert Quant joined BMW in 1959. Um, and then the focus of all the development work shifted to a new model series. Now, this new model series was actually already being considered internally in the past, but it just, it hadn't moved forward yet. It needed someone to really come in and push it forward. Um, and of course, there was a lot riding on it. There was no mm. room for failure. This new model 
had to be a success. So you can imagine the pressure that came with that, you know, when the oh, series yeah. premiered at the 1961. I love the fact that there was the International Motor Show in Frankfurt back in 1961. I, yeah. still, I still feel like, you know, they've only been going as long as I've been attending them. But, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but you know, back in 1961. So, um, you know, then it was immediately obvious when it premiered that BMW had scored a huge success in developing this completely new mid-size sedan. Mm, totally. And just like back then, you know, 60 years ago, 1961 in Frankfurt, there was that dire need for change in, and it having being a success and leaving no room for failure. The exact same thing applies to how we now have to change our mentality and how we move things forward to achieve that full carbon neutrality in the future. I mean, it's our planet at stake. And after you saying 60 years, I'm doing the fast math and I'm realizing, whoa, in the 60s, like 1961 to now, that was 60 years ago, but like 2050 is in 30 years. That's yeah. half the time, right? It's like, oh, my brain is going into overdrive. Yeah. Um, so there's a little bit of fast math for you. Um, but <laughs> anyway, um, you might actually be wondering why it's called the Neue Klasse. So, Nikki. Give us the goods. Well, um, I'm first of all going to translate for all of those listening. <laughs> it means a new class, if you yes. <laughs> if you hadn't already guessed it. Um, but yeah, exactly. Why was it called that? Well, basically, BMW launched a range of small cars at the start of the 1960s. There was the BMW Isetta, the BMW 600 and BMW 700. Also at the time, they'd released several large sedans, including the 501, the 502 and the 503 line. And these were actually, they had a bit of a nickname. I like this nickname, the Baroque Angels in Germany. Mm. Um, yeah, which is quite cool. But of course, so we've got the small cars, you've got the big sedans. And what that did is really left a bit of a gap in the middle of the BMW portfolio. And that was exactly the gap needed to be filled. And that's where the Neue Klasse came into its own. So this was the sort of mid-size sedan. And, you know, when it was launched in 1962, BMW was already calling it the Neue Klasse, kind of a bit like a working title, I suppose, yeah. you know, behind the scenes internally. Um, and it hadn't actually been given an official name. But following the 1963 launch of the BMW 1800, the company actually began to deliberately use the term Neue Klasse in public. Um, and actually then from 1964 onwards... That is what its official name was. That's what it was officially called uh, forevermore. And and Super it kind of cool. makes sense, doesn't it? You know, to yeah. call it the Neue Klasse. It, it was a class that didn't really exist before. They had the smaller sedans, they had the larger sedans. And then all of a sudden you opened up to this whole new market, didn't you? It was a peerless new class with that mid-size sedan. And it was a huge, huge success. You know, what I think is so fascinating about just titling this is that it was the working title. And that sort of just transferred on over to the actual name of it. That's mind blowing, right? It sort of feels like the designers and the whole idea was this idea and then it sort of had a working title and then that just became what it is. So I absolutely love how from that creative idea it turned into what it is called now. And, you know, just like the naming of the Neue Klasse, like you were saying, and how the working title became its real name, the exact same thing applies to the phrase circular economy today. Now, these two words, if you are just starting to hear these two words being put together, circular economy, these two words first appeared together in a publication in 1988 called um, The Economic of natural resources. And soon after, that phrase, circular economy, was used worldwide. So there's all these parallels with Neue Klasse and with circular economy, and it's just all coming together today. <laughs> and sometimes I think there's something to be said, isn't there, about the simplicity of naming. Yeah. You know, if it does what it says on the tin, it makes it very easy for it to understand, and it exactly. works. It really does. <laughs> exactly. Um, now, of course, in hindsight, it's always a wonderful thing. Uh, you know, looking back, it's very easy to say that Neue Klasse was successful, but of course, there was so much risk involved. There was a lot of pressure, particularly um, given the fact that BMW had that sort of financial risk going on at the same mm. time. Um, 
so I suppose you might be thinking, well, was it worth it? Was it worth <laughs> taking such a big risk? Um, Jonathan, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, this this is huge. I mean, like like you said, in hindsight, you're like, oh, huge success. But then everything building up to that success, there's a lot at stake. And there were tons of risks involved. Like BMW went all out for preparing uh, for production of the Neue Klasse, like they invested in creating and expanding high-tech production capacity. Um, there was construction of a totally new production hall in the plant uh, in Munich. Um, oh, and they also hired a small number of skilled workers, 3,000. <laughs> <laughs> Just a couple then. But it's interesting. It really is. There is so many parallels, isn't there, to this whole sort of, you know, electrification of cars. Because again, yeah. that was a big risk. That was a big gamble. Mm. You know, BMW were the very first. I had a big clear out of my um, attic the other day and I've got this stack of old National Geographic magazines. And I opened one up and it was from 2011. And at the front page, as you open it up, was an advert for the new future BMW i8 and i3. And it was like a concept <laughs> design of them before yeah. they'd hit the road. And I was like, oh, wow, that's amazing. <laughs> and now they're on our roads today. And they're so yeah. popular and we're all doing it. Um, but, you know, again, back there, it was, it was a huge risk. <laughs> yeah, massive risk. And so many, so many things put up to stake, you know, and 3,000 workers, you know. That's a lot. Yeah, it's a lot. Of, it's, it's not easy to find as well. Yeah, exactly. But, you know, I think they knew they were taking a big risk, so they implemented this, which I just go, this is genius. Um, BMW, they introduced a multi-stage in-process quality inspection system. That's a very long word, for long phrase, for basically just checking that all these risks that they're taking – didn't go down a rabbit hole and spiral into something horrible. They took risks, but they had all these different processes of checking if those risks were worth it, right? So this made it completely possible to quickly address problems arising during production. I mean, we all know this, right? If you're on the road, you take a, a wrong turn. You want to immediately get back on the highway and get back on the right direction. But there were so many wrong turns that they could have made. This implementation of this multi-stage in-process quality inspection system really addressed the problems head on and minimized risks tremendously and kept everything on track. So with that said, was it worth the risk? Yeah. Well, let's just say that this tremendous commercial success led to rapid growth at BMW during the 60s with pioneering business decisions, even closer collaboration between development and sales, and also improved planning of vehicle characteristics and features. This was massive. It was definitely worth the risk. And the Neue Klasse helped BMW stake out a much clearer market position as a manufacturer of both sporty and everyday vehicles. And I mean, as you can see in the sales numbers, just get ready for this. In the 10 years between 1960 and 1970 alone, sales of BMW cars tripled. Wow. Gosh. Tripled. Well, okay. So I think you can say that was a success. <laughs> yeah. That was worth it, Amazing. right? There was revenue from vehicles increasing more than sevenfold in that same period. And in total, a bit of a numbers geek over here, um, an impressive 339,000 814 units of the 1800 sedans and, of course, other models in the series were produced between February 1962 and January 1972. So, yeah, it was worth the risk. <laughs> yeah, I think so. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That just shows the risk can pay off. Um, Most definitely. What an achievement, though. Really, really, really impressive, actually, looking back at those stats and those figures um, to, you know, be producing, gosh, well over an excess of 300,000 cars Crazy. between that period. Period. Um, but obviously with this sort of this history lesson repeating itself um, and giving us the blueprint on change with BMW wanting to achieve full carbon neutrality across its supply chain by 2050. We are going to ask ourselves once again, is it worth mm. the risk? Yeah. Well, I think it is a resounding yes. It absolutely yeah. is. Most definitely. I think this blueprint, I mean, it's not just... <laughs> You know, I just go, this is amazing, right? We just set all the numbers. We just set all the risks that were involved and all the successes that they had. This truly is a blueprint for BMW to say, okay, if we can do it on this, we can do it on that. And I think that's really impressive to have. Yeah. 
Okay, I know that we're so excited about talking about risks and successes, but for the petrol heads out there, we promised you something. We do not want to disappoint Nikki. <laughs> Let's get into these details. Okay, fine. So this is <laughs> for the petrol heads out there. We dedicate this part of our podcast to you. To you. <laughs> um, now, of course, the success of the Neue Klasse is actually mainly thanks to that high tech production process that you mentioned earlier, Jonathan. Um, yep. And, you know, all of a sudden, once you have that set up, that was, um, well, it, it kind of allowed the production, doesn't it, of the dynamic sporty mid-size sedans. And then what we had, um, we had a lot of cars on the road powered by four-cylinder engines at various performance levels. Um and it was actually then succeeded by the BMW 5 Series back in 1972. So just recapping on which models were unveiled when. There was the 1500 model, which was unveiled to the public at the 1961 International Motor Show in Frankfurt. And then there was the 1600 in 1964, which was added to the range. Um, and really, actually, the only main changes to that car was the engine. Um, and then there were special versions versions of the 1800 model and they were made as homologated vehicles um, and used in motorsports. So they were not just road cars, they were race cars as well. And then, of course, there was the start of this inseparable bond between BMW and motorsport. And actually, in 1966, that BMW 1800 led BMW to win the Spa 24-hour race in Belgium. And that was the start of a very beautiful thing because I think they went on to win it something like 24 out of the 70 times that it was wow. held. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so really, that is a, a race that BMW has um, a lot of trophies. In. <laughs> Talk about trailblazing. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> so speaking of something that everybody loves about the BMW car is, you guessed it, the kidney grill. I mean, come on. Come on. <laughs> I think we say it's a love-hate relationship because yeah, every time it changes, everyone goes, yeah. oh, and then exactly. they get used to it and they go, ah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So this was probably, you know, also one of those moments for BMW fans in the 60s. And I mean, rightfully so. The front of the earliest Neue Klasse, it had round headlights, and but uh, models with square lights came along a little bit later. Um, and they also had a side profile resembling a shark's nose, but but most distinctively, a pair of vertical kidney grills standing together at the center, smidged together, almost looking like the number 11. And I'm sure that there were some people that fell in love with it <laughs> and some people that didn't. <laughs> <laughs> no, I actually, I quite like it. Um, I it think is, it's cool. Yeah, it is cool, isn't it? Again, it's very characteristic of the era, um, but it was a cool look, that's for sure. Yeah, most definitely. Very racy. <laughs> yeah. And also, there was something that you love pronouncing and saying, and I just love the story of, the Hofmeister Kink. I mean, this is truly, I mean, if you're a designer, the greatest accolade any designer could get is <laughs> getting something named after them, like a specific design element named after them. And Wilhelm Hofmeister is one of those people that received that honor. Now, together with his team... Wilhelm was responsible for that distinctive transition of the C-pillar on the Neue Klasse. For stability reasons, this feature was not designed as a smooth curve, but instead included an angle. But today, every self-respecting car enthusiast knows this shape as the Hofmeister Kank. And I think this is so cool because everybody knows what it is, but they might not know that it actually started with the Neue Klasse and that it was named after the designer that did this. Yeah, it is very cool, Mr. Hofmeister. Uh, exactly. Yeah, as you say, I mean, what an achievement to be known uh, throughout the entire history of BMW's exactly. design. Amazing. Exactly. <laughs> Um, now, as well as all that going on, we did say that we would talk about um, the highlights for the petrol engines out there, uh, because, of course, <laughs> under that no frills hood was a newly designed four cylinder engine. Now, the base model came with a 1.5 litre engine, which is why the model variant carries the name 1500, because that is obviously the capacity in cubic centimetres. And uh, it delivered a whopping 80 horsepower on launch. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, but what it really did was it helped the model achieve this sort of ambitious driving performance, obviously 
in that era and everyone was kind of blown away by it and after that there were far more powerful engine variants that would then follow and that were also launched in its succession. This, of course, is also one of the reasons why BMW has always been closely associated with the term dynamic since the launch of the Neue Klasse. Dynamic driving, that's what we see with BMWs. And this is kind of where it originated from. Mm. And then just over the years, I think that four-cylinder engine formed the basis for further developments of all the other variants that we've seen on our roads. Exactly. Hofmeister Kank, the four-cylinder engine, it's just... It's like the starting point to something new, which I think is so cool, you know. Also something that I absolutely love to talk about, which is design and think is so cool. Because when you see a Neue Klasse, you just know what it is, right? You just know exactly what it is. And this restrained and functional design of the four-door body, it was truly just going off in a completely other direction, a deliberate departure from the classic and luxurious lines of the BMW 501, the 502, the 503, and ah, the flowing shapes of the design. It just really created this sporty, yet also elegant impression that I just love. And BMW perfectly captured the essence of the times. I mean, if you look at a Neue Klasse, you just go, yep. <laughs> It looks like you're just back in the 1960s, right? So it it really is this iconic time-traveling piece of design that is just like, that is what it is, and you know exactly what it is. Um, Also, the Neue Klasse was designed by the young head designer at BMW, like I said, Wilhelm Hofmeister, but he worked together with a renowned Italian designer, Giovanni Mitalotti, and you could say these two people working together represented the renaissance of the sporty mid-size vehicle. If I'm getting a bit too poetic, just, you know, <laughs> tell me to tone it down. We love a bit of poetry, Jonathan. <laughs> Don't let us stop you. <laughs> <laughs> but it truly is the renaissance, you know, because like I said before, it's just iconic. And you can see this as it carried the essential characteristics of the BMW 326, 327, 328, and BMW 328 models forward into the 1960s. So those models had given the BMW brand its unmistakable look back then in the 1930s that they built upon later. And not only did this fill a niche in its own model range for BMW, but it carved out an entirely new segment like we've been talking about today. Sportiness coupled with exclusivity. In other words, I'm getting poetic again. (laughs) An entirely new class. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm so- I had to. <laughs> we love it. Keep going. Keep going. <laughs> well, I mean, and also, like we were saying, carving out this blueprint for how to, you know, make these big changes and adapt and lean into the risk and go uh-huh. for it. With the Neue Klasse, it carved out a whole new segment, and that's what BMW is doing right now, working towards 2050. Oh, you know? totally. Absolutely. But it's weird, isn't it? Because, well, now it's like you couldn't imagine not having yeah. the Neue Klasse as a segment in BMW's portfolio um, and what it stands for. And then, you know, in a couple of years time people will look back and be like what well of course we always had electric cars as you know and we always had sustainability as part of um the dna and car manufacturing but actually of course that was not the case at all big changes are coming but um, it's great to hear how of course that neuro cluster was such a big success for bmw because as we've mentioned there was a a huge amount of risk at stake as there always is when you're delving into new sort of sectors and and of course it's not easy when you're doing production on such a large scale it's a, it's extremely complicated requires a huge amount of investment and expansion and um, and yeah and risk as we've mentioned so yeah. um the update around the model and and you know obviously creating that positioning worked really well um there was th- that demand for it at the time and that's really has sort of paved the way for the future mm. of the brand as we heard you know the successes you know in terms of the numbers and and you know what was it three times the number of units sold during that period, which is incredible. It's insane. Like those numbers are off the charts, you know. And like I said before, it's iconic. You look at it and you know exactly what it is. And, you know, this model series, it was and dare I say, still remains a milestone in the history of the company. And looking back, I mean, this was a really exciting new chapter in the company story and the brand story as well. And like I said before, it's sort of like the blueprint. It guides BMW's development even today, you know? 
Yeah, absolutely. I feel like we should um, develop our podcast and create a vodcast. And next time we should actually go and see the Neue Klasse and we oh, can like yeah. <laughs> do a little tour around it. That would be cool. That'd be awesome. Because um, <laughs> seeing it face to face would be mega. I've never actually been in a Neue Klasse before. Have you? Not yet. No. Okay, right. We'll try. <laughs> <laughs> we'll try. We'll report back. We will. We'll do on this our best. Mini revolution. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So many revolutions <laughs> happening right now. <laughs> oh, the one in 1961, another one happening right here on this podcast. And then, of course, that other one uh, electrification and the fact that BMW began carbon neutral by 2050. Wow. Lots Amazing. of exciting things to look forward to. <laughs> yes. Yes. So there you have it our take on the blueprint of the Neue Klasse and how it relates to the the future of 2050 for sustainable driving and the circular economy. I've yeah. got good hopes. I've got high hopes for it. I think the blueprint could work. It's worked in the past. It's got to work in the future. Well, there we go. If Jonathan says it's going to work, BMW, <laughs> you can relax. There we go. <laughs> Watch that share price shoot up. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Well, thank you so much, everybody, for listening to this week's episode of Changing Lanes. Yeah. And remember, if you have enjoyed this episode, do subscribe to our podcast because yes. then you get notifications on all the new episodes that drop. And we've got some pretty cool stuff coming soon. We do, most definitely. And to dive even deeper into all things BMW, head on over to BMW.com to learn even more. My name is Nikki Shields. And my name is Jonathan Tilly. And this has been Changing Lanes. See you next time. <laughs>